welcome. Welcome, 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 everybody. I'm really, really happy to see all of you here. You know, any opportunity for the community to come together is always a celebration for me. I just feel happy to gather together. Welcome. So the meeting today, before I forget, is being videoed. Thank you, Joseph, who will post online with the video later so everybody who wasn't able to be here can review the video. And by the way, if you don't want to be on video, be sure to sit in the section behind Joseph over here. <laughs> Before we begin, for full transparency, it would be helpful for all of us to know if there are any here today who are working with or, or representing the Wonder Inn project, including the owners and their team. If so, please identify yourself. Thank you. So, who are we? What's our intention? What will we be talking about today? My name is Beth, and this is Russ, and we're part of the Stop Wonder Inn working group. Uh, yeah, who are we? Uh, Stop Wonder Inn is an informational group of those of us who live in Wonder Valley and those who are concerned about the proposed luxury hotel and the impact this would have on our community and our way of life. We are nonpartisan, we are not connected with any political party, and we have rented this space and purchased the buttons and stickers and everything else from our own personal funds for this meeting today. We do not have a specific leader, we work collectively. We are simply caring members of this valley and the community, and what we share is a belief that this project would be a detriment for Wonder Valley and its community. When this project was first proposed and when the plans became available, we each had initial thoughts and feelings about it. All of us in the community did. In a PAC meeting last May, many Wonder, Valor, many Wonder Valley residents spoke out against this project. We now have the California Environmental Quality Act, or CEQA, as we call it, the initial study report, which was made public by Land Use Services on the evening of Friday, January 13th. After reading through the developer submittals, we noted a lot of information that was missing, as well as contradictions within their own study. So we wanted to share with you what we found out and what we know of the official process in order for this project to be considered and finally voted on by the San Bernardino County Board of Supervisors. So what is our intention? As Russ mentioned, today's meeting will be focused on what CEQA is and how it works. We'll share some preliminary concerns that we've identified with the Wonder and Developers Plan and we'll share some of our concerns about how this project could impact our community. To be clear, this is not a meeting to debate who supports the project or who's against the project, but rather to share with you a few highlights of what we've learned so far in response from the Land Use Services Report. This is a learning process. None of us are experts. So how will we spend our time today? We'll begin with a brief description of the proposed Wonder Inn project. Then we'll share a brief explanation of what CEQA is. Then we'll talk about what our concerns are about the proposed project, which leads to our goal, which is to request a full EIR study or environmental impact report. But we request that that be done. And finally, most important, how all of us can share our comments with the County Land Use Services. We're hoping to wrap up by 3 o'clock today. All of the documents issued by the county related to this project are accessible to the public, so each of you could verify any information that we're sharing with you today. <clears throat> this handout, there's a handout that we've put up front there, um, uh, includes the links for you to review the documents. The links are also available on the Stop Wondering website for useful access. Again... Specifically, what we're asking for is that a full study, the EIR, be done prior to the county voting on this project, and that our community has a chance to comment again on the project following the EIR. The CEQA study is an initial study, kind of like a quick glance by the county based on the information that the, the developers provided. An EIR, the full study, has not yet been done, and in our view, is a must. This is the first project of this magnitude in this small rural community, and all efforts must be made to understand its impact 
on the people and the critters who live here. Personally, <laughs> I prefer this big development not be located in Wonder Valley, and I'd like to know, I'd like to be assured that the concerns of this community have been heard and taken into consideration before the project is confirmed, approved. I think that asking for an EIR is a reasonable request. Uh, we'll be getting down to business in just a moment, but before we do, we have, we have the request of each of you, guidelines, if you will, on how we'd like to work together today. The guidelines are. Please be patient and avoid interrupting others, including the speakers. There will be a time for questions later in the meeting. Please make a note of your questions. We have paper and pencil up front if you need to. Um, and make note of your questions and save it for that time later. <clears throat> When the time comes for questions or comments, please be concise so that there's time for everyone's questions. Uh, yes, there's no need to repeat points or questions that have already been made. We are on a, a, a time schedule here. <laughs> everyone's perspective is valuable. Please be respectful. Okay, I just want to make sure everyone can agree on this and, and we'll take questions later on. Thank you. But first, let's take a moment to celebrate. You may have heard that we cleared our first hole hurdle, the extension of the comment deadline. To date, the public has submitted over 130 comments. Thank you all. The public has submitted over 130 comments in opposition to the wondering proposal via our website. Thank you to everyone who took the time to send in comments to request the extension. And we got it. 15 days were added to the comment period. And now we have we all have a total of 36 days from that day. Uh, to review the report until the 22nd of February to digest it, do our research, and formulate a reply to the county. Yes, this is an example of what can happen when a community pulls together. Thank you all. We were able to achieve our first goal. Yay. Yay. So I want to share this cool word cloud with you that was borrowed from the Wonder Valley Community Action Guide which is part of the San Bernardino County General Plan. This was generated from comments made by the Winter Valley community on the community survey done back in 2015. So these are descriptors from our own community. This was part of the county's process of creating the Winter Valley Community Action Guide, creating this. You'll notice that the size of the words are scaled to how often the word was mentioned in the survey. I see some of the larger ones are quiet, solitude, Rural, beauty, affordability is always good. <laughs> what do you appreciate the most about Wonder Valley? Why did you move here? Hold on to that thought. So this is an example, an excerpt, from the Wonder Valley Community Action Guide, which is part of the San Bernardino County Plan. They say, the values are those shared assets, principles, standards, mores and in the judgment of the community what is important in the lives of its residents and businesses. A community's value are important considerations in sh shaping its aspirations, focus, and actions. As a community, Wonder Valley values rural atmosphere, the large lots and spaces between properties that give room for residents to breathe, wide open spaces which allow residents to appreciate and maintain the solitude, solid Terry, excuse me. <laughs> Solitary, laid back lifestyles. <clears throat> Natural desert beauty. Residents value the beautiful sunrises and sunsets, the dark and starry night skies, and the desert views and wildlife. Community spirit. Wonder Valley is a tight knit community whose residents value self reliance and neighborly support. The people have a respect for nature, freedom, privacy, and each other. Here, residents work together but also enjoy their independence and being left alone in solitude. I think that captures it pretty well, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you again, everybody, for coming out today. And now we'd like to introduce Chris. And fire safety. The electricity service will come from Edison. There is no mention in the plans of solar. There will be propane with a 6,500 gallon tank plus a generator. And because it all comes down to this at the end, doesn't it? A septic tank with a 0.3 acre leach field, 300 feet east of the parking lot. So I'm, I'm thinking that's, that's over here. Uh, 
<clears throat> and there will be some road modifications. Rick's going to be talking about that in the transportation section. So <clears throat> that's the overview. That's the stats. That's the future that's planned for the pink building and our community. But I want to talk for a moment about the past of the pink building. Uh, so there's always a lot of rumor about the origins of the pink building. How many of you have heard that it was post office? Yeah. Well, no, yeah, it never was. Uh, if you knew it was actually an electrical co-op, good for you. It was built in 1962 as the headquarters for the Desert Electrical Cooperative. And this is an article from the Desert Trail from March 1962. Rick and I went over to the Historical Society in 29 Palms and dug, dug through the old editions of the Desert Trail and found several articles on this. Look at that beautiful architectural rendering. Can you see that? That was our pink building once upon a time. So the Desert Electrical Co-op was formed in 1950 with help from the Rural Electrification Administration, or the REA. The REA was a federal program formed to bring electrification to the rural parts of the country. In the 1930s, only 3% of farms were electrified and investor-owned utilities weren't interested in bringing electricity to rural areas. So farmers started forming their own cooperatives to take advantage of loans from the REA. The Desert Electrical Cooperative was part of that movement, formed locally by local people and serving specifically homesteader communities from here in Wonder Valley all the way to Rim Rock. By 1962, DEC was ready to build itself a new headquarters with REA loans, as this article details. There was a lot of pride in this building, which had administrative offices, a maintenance yard, a meeting auditorium, and even a demonstration kitchen to show the ladies how to cook with electricity. <laughs> the DEC was uh, later bought out by Edison in 1966. Uh, Edison sold the building in 1981, and the property went to uh, be used as residence and Jehovah Farm, among other things, and we're going to have uh, a little bit more about that later. So <clears throat> I'm still doing research about the building and the DEC, but I can say that our old pink building clearly is a rich expression of the energy, initiative, and can-do spirit of our unique and historical homestead community. Mm -hmm something to be proud of. And yet, there is no mention of this history or this historic community in the initial study for the project. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nothing. Right. Nothing about the co-op, mm -hmm. nothing about huh. the Small Tract Act, or the homesteader community. Not, you think there was nothing in Wonder Valley and never had been anything here. The developer and their contractors simply did not do the basic research work of looking in the local paper of record for this clearly available history. Instead, they did a little light Googling, found some rumors of a post office, but decided it probably wasn't a post office, did a hand wave at the Jojoba Farm in the pyramids, and called it a day. Then based on this non-research, they dared to claim that the property has no historic significance. <laughs> the consultants actually say in their report, and I quote, <clears throat> no contemporaneous newspaper stories have confirmed its original use, oh, oh, but it appears on historic aerial photographs by 1970. Well, thank you very much. Maybe if you had come down out of the sky and walked yourself over to the museum, you might have found those contemporaneous newspaper stories that would confirm its original use. This matters, Peter. This failure on their part matters because under the requirements of CEQA, <clears throat> That's the California Environmental Quality Act, which governs the process we're doing here. That's what this initial study is part of. These folks have to do their due diligence and report the facts so that the public and the decision makers can determine whether the project is going to have impacts on the environment and the community. Based on their own non-research, they conclude that the building and the community are not eligible to be considered a historic or cultural resource and therefore the project will have no significant impact on us. Clearly, we need to respond to this deficient analysis and mistaken conclusion. I myself will be preparing my comments on the initial study to point out this deficiency, and with more research, explain why this building and this community are indeed historical and cultural resources that must be considered under CEQA. 
Now I've gone uh, into all this as an example of the kinds of things that can be wrong in this initial study and one way of responding to it. So let's hear more about CEQA. It matters, as I said, because it governs everything we're doing at this stage. The county, the public, the developer, all of us are laboring under CEQA. <clears throat> so Pat Flanagan is now going to take a few minutes to tell us about the CEQA process. And then I'll come back and tell you where we are in that process right now with the One Year In Project. Good morning. The, the, is this working? No? Christian, turn it on. Christian, hold the power. Here we go. No. Here? Still not. Yeah. No, you probably went off. Oh, there you go. Okay. Um, first of all, I'm from Desert Heights. I'm not from Wonder Valley. And I come um, as a member of the Morongo Basin Conservation Association. And I just asked them to put up our mission statement so you know why you can't keep me out of this. <laughs> uh, the Morongo Basin Conservation Association, MBCA, advocates for the healthy desert environment that nurtures our rural character, cultural wealth, and economic well-being. We all care about that, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just had our 53rd uh, yearly annual meeting, 54th annual meeting, and we brought to share with you a map that we put up called Short-Term Rentals in the Morongo Basin so that you can see how many there are out in Wonder Valley, which is also not mentioned in the um, initial study. So, now we can go on to the next slide. CEQA. How many people hate to hear acronyms, you know? If you're not in the military, it's like, give me a break. Okay, so you remember California Environmental Quality Act. And next slide. It is purpose is to prevent significant avoidable damage to the environment and to foster informed public decision-making, ensure transparency in governmental decision-making processes, and encourage public participation. CEQA was put together so that people wouldn't make decisions behind closed doors. And it's actually a wonderful roadmap. So you have to get up worrying about the acronym and get into the roadmap, okay? Now, the roadmap is going to uh, have environmental factors that will be explored. And the environmental factors checked below will be potentially affected by this project involving at least one impact that is potentially significant impact as indicated by the checklist on the following pages. Now, this is a cut and paste thing. So you, and I have, there will be a more lengthy CEQA slideshow that'll be on the Stop Wonder Inn so that you can, you know, sort of relax. You don't have to remember all this and take notes. So they're looking at aesthetics, you know, is this a beautiful place? And you will find that maybe they consider beauty something other than you, and you get to comment on that. The biology, the agriculture and forestry, you don't have to worry about that. Air quality, you'll hear about that. Biological resources, cultural resources. So they go through these various uh, elements, and then the last, there's a mandatory findings of significance. So the, uh, and uh, also we're going to be putting up on the website is the checklist. And the checklist, it not only has the um, elements, it asks questions. So it asks, uh, I think you can do the next slide, but I'm I don't not going to there. I don't think we have. Okay, um, not quite yet. So just to, I'll do the aesthetics one. Um, the questions, have a substantial adverse effect on a scenic vista. Would this be potentially significant impact, less than significant with mitigation incorporated, less than significant impact, no impact. And that has to be checked. So this will be, you can go through this and you can look at the questions. Substantially damaged scenic resources, including but not limited to trees, rock, outcroppings, and historic buildings within a state uh, scenic highway. Well, this is a county scenic highway. They haven't done their, their work to get it to be a state, but that's not your fault. 
And also, for the people who comment on this, they don't live in the Basin and Range province. So they're talking about, you know, do you have some big, tall rocks up there or whatever? Basins <laughs> are scenic. The open area between mountains is scenic. We have to keep pointing that out to them because they don't live out here. They aren't, they're on the edge of the Basin and Range province. We have over 100 mountain ranges within the Mojave and the Colorado Desert and up into Death Valley. Okay, next. The environmental report is the heart of CEQA, used by lead and responsible agencies. The lead agency is the county. Um, those, and they have the discretionary authority to approve or carry out a portion of the project to evaluate environmental, environmental impacts of this approval. So that, but you get to see it first uh, in the initial study to see if they're covering them completely or maybe not. And that's, that's what we're already finding out, okay? Uh, okay. You can go back to an EIR. Um, when they gave the initial study, what they said was, in this thousand pages of background material and whatever, that, that there was not going to be an effect that couldn't be mitigated while they were constructing it. So they, they gave it a mitigated negative declaration. Don't be afraid of that. It just says, we don't have to do any more just to prove it. Uh, how many think that's a swell idea? <laughs> so we're saying no. And for these reasons, based on the elements of CEQA and what we find out, uh, that's not correct. You have to do an EIR to present all of the, you have to do your research, such as the history of the building. So is that clear to everybody? You got yeah. that, okay. Thank you, Pat. And so much for these communities. Uh, I'm going to try doing without the mic again. Did that work out okay before? Yeah. All right. All right. So, yeah, CEQA, as Pat was describing, that's the process that the Wonder Inn proposal is going through right now. So, where are we in it? This is a, a kind of a generic CEQA flow chart. And uh, what's important to notice here. If there, there, is that there's two tracks that a project proposal can go down. Uh, this one on the left is the heavy duty, full in-depth analysis path, the EIR path. Then over here we have the shortcut cursory study path. <laughs> All right, and both of them end up in the same place with the same decision makers making a decision here in the decision box. So where are we on this chart? Well, when the Wonder Inn proposal application came into the process, it went through a few preliminary steps, and then it got to top box, lead agency prepares the initial study, which is this plus uh, over 900 pages of appendices. Mm. So the lead agency in this case, as Pat mentioned, that's our county of San Bernardino. So county, county land use services looked over all the materials that were submitted by the developer including their application and the studies done by their consultants. And land use services prepared the initial study. They then came to a critical decision point, this second box here. And that was whether to go down track A or track B. Oh. Track A, as I mentioned, is the heavy duty, full in-depth analysis path where the project is fully and rigorously studied to identify potential significant impacts on the environment and on us. This is the path of the EIR, like Pat mentioned, the Environmental Impact Report, EIR, important term. Unfortunately for us, land use services looked over the initial study and decided, eh, we're good with it. We don't think there's going to be any environmental impacts so significant that we can't mitigate them, meaning make tweaks in the plan so that any pimp impacts are less than significant. So instead of going down track A here, they took a turn to go to track B, the shortcut, the negative declaration path. 
negative declaration, like Pat was saying, they declare that the project won't have significant impacts. <coughs> and in the case of the Wonder Inn, they made it a mitigated negative declaration, meaning they're putting a few conditions on the proposal to mitigate any impacts to less than significant. So mitigated negative declaration. So here we go down the chute. And Land Use Services has uh, now released the initial study with its mitigated negative declaration for the republic, for the public, for our review. And that's exactly where we are right now, mm -hmm. public review period. And side note, uh, thanks to the efforts of all of you, the community, that review period is just a little longer than it was originally. Because of the comments you set, sent in, we got an extra couple of weeks on that. So congratulations, everybody. All right, so what happens next after the public review period? Uh, LUS, Land Use Services, they're gonna look over all the comments we send in. They're gonna discuss any issues they deem significant with the developers. And ultimately, they send it on to the Planning Commission with a recommendation to either approve or deny the application. Mm -hmm. The Planning Commission will then hold a public hearing, which we will know about and be able to attend and then they vote to either approve or deny the project. And from there, it zooms over to the decision box where it gets finalized by the Board of Supervisors. Now, I'll note that there are some opportunities along the way for some appeals and some various kinds of shenanigans, but big picture, that's where we're headed. So here on the negative declaration path, that's our future, people. Not a lot of opportunity for our concerns to be addressed in the process. And it moves pretty fast. Uh, the proposal could go before the Planning Commission by late March. Mm. So we would like a different future. We don't want the shortcut path. So here's our plan. We're going to push back on this path. We are going to push, push, push our way all the way back to the, that decision point up there. And we are going to demand that land use services reverse course instead get us on track A, the yeah, EIR yeah. path. Wow. Right. <laughs> full in-depth analysis of the potential impacts of this project on our community and our resources. We deserve that, and land use services has the ability to revisit that decision and change it and do what's needed. So how do we make that happen? Yeah. How do we get land use services to reverse course? We do it with kick-ass comments that are serious and substantial and raise issues that call the initial study into question. We demonstrate that the study is not complete and is not accurate. Like I was talking about with the pink building. No, that stuff was not correct and also things were completely left out. Not acceptable. But can we succeed at this? What are the chances that we can get land use services to go back up the path to the EIR? Well, it is a tough lift, but it's been done before, and we can do it. Many groups of citizens have succeeded in pressuring planning departments to reverse course and require an EIR after all. I was part of a group right here in the basin that succeeded in doing that in the fight over the Bolo Rail Cycle mega dump at Amboy in the 1990s. A mega dump that you may notice has never been built. And speaking of victories, don't forget this one that we just had right here, right now, this review period being extended. You did that, people. You did it. You already have successfully pressured land use services to listen to your demands, your reasonable demands, to have sufficient time to review the potential for harm to your community. We can do it again, and that's our goal. Push back push back all the way to an EIR. Yeah. So that's what we're that's gonna be our main point of what we want to do when we leave here today is prepare to write a comment asking for an EIR. We want to back that up with substantial evidence, not speculation or our opinion, but facts. These facts can be based on your uh, own experience and observation, but they must be facts you can support. For this part of CEQA, substantial evidence is what is required to move the needle. All right, 
So now we want to get on to some of the specific concerns we have, the potential problems that we've already identified in the initial study and that we intend to comment on. CEQA has a specific set of uh, elements that, that uh, Pat had up on the screen before, aesthetics and uh, biological and all those categories. Uh, we're not going to have time to go into all of them this afternoon, so we've selected a few that are of particular concern. Members of our working group will be, be presenting some points from what we're learning so far. And we also thank uh, community member Mark Houston for stepping in for Rena, who is held up and will not be here today. Share this with you. Um, some things that she was thinking about is what is the potential impact on our local electrical grid of an additional one gigawatt per year of electric demand. Should Wonder Valley expect additional outages, especially during the summer months due to the increased load? And should we expect any planned outages um, from Edison for needing to upgrade the system because of the additional demand? Also, how long can um, the Wonder Inn generators <coughs> maintain a climate controlled environment during an extended um, summer blackout? And will the Wonder Inn guests compete with residents in finding cooler places to stay during an extended summer blackout as well? Other areas as far as within the utility section for the CEQA um, report, uh, look at, uh, sorry, um, are there sufficient water supplies available? The project documents indicate that two wells on the property will supply the project's water. The project's documents have indicated that a pipeline from the city of 29 Palms is not feasible for their budget. Therefore, they'll be relying on our basin. The basin that we really don't know too much about right now because studies have not been done on them within the last 40 years. Um, and certainly the demand of water within the last 40 years has increased. Um, so it is important that we do get an ERR so that we can um, maybe study our basin a little bit closer um, and what the demands are. Um, they also talk about in the study about, um, they will provide bottled water for their guests and eventually look into installing an RO system. <coughs> they don't go too far into an RO system, but um, as I'm sure some of us know that RO systems create waste. I'm sorry, I have a great deal of trouble understanding you. Can you hold it up a little bit? Oh, way? sorry. <coughs> Is that better? Um, RO, RO systems, um, they create waste as well as water, and the, um, the ratio is not discussed in the um, document, and nor is uh, the amount of water that would be created with it. Um, and providing bottled water, water for the guests um, would be considered holding water, which according to our county's regulations, uh, new construction is not supposed to be hauling in water. Um, yeah. These are just a few of the points of concern that I pulled from the CEQA document myself, comparing it um, to the uh, sorry, comparing it to the project's documents um, and trying to gather up for commenting to the County Planning Commission. Thank you. No, if it's okay, I'm just going to speak loud because I need my notes. <laughs> this isn't all in my head yet. So my two sections are greenhouse gas and public services. First of all, greenhouse gas, really, really technical area for me. It's much harder than it was when I sat for my state board exams for my nursing license. Really complicated. Whoa. <laughs> um, one thing I noticed, thank you, Pat, is that there are no plans in this document for including solar. I mean, this is a huge project. We've got all this sunshine out here. Why is there no solar included in this plan? It's crazy. I mean, I'll spare you the uh, <laughs> going over the stats again about how big the project is, but you know, how is this gonna affect our electrical grid? I mean, we already have power outages, as Jacqueline mentioned. I mean, summer heat, air conditioning, 
Bread goes down, ooh. <laughs> so public services is my other area, and public services includes services that we, the taxpayers, pay for, like our fire, big thing here, our paramedic services, sheriff services, road maintenance, all of this is in public services, right? So I don't really need to remind those of us here in Wonder Valley about the fire issue. I mean, we just lost our fire department how long ago? They increased our taxes and then took away our fire department. Out where we live, which is over between Godwin and Gamble in the Gamble Township, we used to have like a three to four minute response rate for fire, medic, fire paramedics, which is really great for out here. And now they have to come in from in town, right? By Adobe, south of uh, the highway there. I mean, it's like a 12 to 15 minutes response time now, okay? As a nurse speaking, you know, somebody chokes, somebody has a heart attack, brain death begins in like four to five minutes. So we're already don't have the services that we need to support lives out here, right? I think that's a problem. <laughs> um, lost my place. Oh, the question, will Wonder Valley residents, are we gonna have to compete for emergency services now based on these people, you know? I think it's gonna be a wonderful resort somewhere else, <laughs> you know? So we have to compete for fire services, paramedic services. Um, if the county decides to build a fire department out here now, which would be great, but now we're gonna pay for that too because these people wanna put a project out here for us? What's that about? <laughs> Paramedics, I think I mentioned. Will the Wonder Inn have their own first aid services? Mm. It's not mentioned in the plan. Yeah. So we're going to put the bill for that, right? If the county decides that more emergency services are, area, are needed in our area, personnel, emergency medical tech units, whatever, are they going to raise our taxes to pay for that? Police, the sheriff, <laughs> we love our sheriff friends. They do the best they can. They're always short-staffed, seems to me. We call for help. Oh my God, there's a weird person on the property here. <laughs> sometimes they can respond, sometimes they can't because they prioritize their responses, right? I mean, if somebody's getting beat up at skaters down there and I've got a weird person on my property, who are they gonna respond to? <laughs> That's okay. I mean, they're doing the best they can, but they don't have enough people. They don't have the people they need to keep us safe. And so what's gonna happen when we add this huge Hotel, luxury resort hotel, hello, Target. <laughs> Who's gonna wanna be, you know, pound, breaking the windows in the cars in the parking lot, you know, breaking out the Mercedes windows and, you know, oh look, there's a cell phone. I mean, you know, you got a problem on your property, they got somebody breaking in a car out there, who's gonna get the priority service? Ain't gonna be us, but we're gonna pay for it. You know, what's that about? <laughs> Roads and maintenance. So Rick is gonna cover transportation a little bit more later, but just, just putting it out there, roads and maintenance. Thank God, Tim Candelari is back. We love him. He does such a great job on our dirt roads, right? We got a new road grader, all this kind of stuff. Well, hey, now we're gonna have twice as much traffic out there. People doing their poverty tourism to see how the rest of us live. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we get to pay for their travel on our neighborhood roads, right? Amboy Road, I mean, you know, blessings, they do a good job trying to keep that road maintained, but if you've been on Godwin between like the highway and Amboy recently, yeah. it's in a constant state of disrepair, right? I mean, it's almost to the point of like axle braking as you're going down the road. Who's paying for that? We are. The area between on Gamel, where the project is supposed to be, between Amboy and the highway. Okay, that's a direct route to get to the, to the park, right? Are they going to pay that? Has anybody even really looked at that? I mean, well, what's going on, people? So, with the increased traffic generated by the hotel cause, increased road maintenance and repairs needed, and therefore increased our taxes. And oh, by the way, did I mention, according to the 2020 census, number one, Wonder Valley average age is 67 and 65. I mean, you know. And, the average median income out here is $16,379 a year. That's our average income. But we're gonna have to put the bill for this? What the hell? <laughs> okay, one last little point. We're artists. I know, right? 
a lot of artists out here. We don't make a lot we don't of money. Live, we don't make <laughs> so, this is a little bit of a long shot, but just thinking about possibilities, right? Water and sewer, okay? We don't have water and sewer out here, right? We all have water wells or tanks if we got in before the grandfather clause. We have our own septic, yada, yada. What if, what if this luxury hotel suddenly is generating a lot of money? And what if 20 Palm says, hey, wow, you know what? We want to cut it out. Let's annex Wonder Valley, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then immediately, now we're going to be paying for a whole new water system. God knows how much that's going to be. We're going to be paying for a sewer system like Yucca Valley. Mm -hmm. Again, we're going to be paying so many, the possibility, I should say, paying so many taxes out here. Who's going to be able to pay your property tax at the end of the year? We're going to lose our homes. Affordability, remember the cloud, the, the word cloud? Affordability is one of the problems, one of the things that we come out here for. I need to do a lot more research on this. I'm working on it. <laughs> these are just some of the questions that kind of come up for me as I'm reading these plans that these people put out. How is this going to impact us? How is it going to impact our wallet? That's my thing. I will try again. I've been coming to this area for 20 years. Every year, fell in love with it a little bit more. And two years ago, my wife and I decided to move here. So we've, we've been living here for two years. And this is a special community. And it's already been pointed out before, this word cloud is kind of showing what this community values. And I don't want to get into all of these. I only want to concentrate on the quiet mm -hmm. and the noise. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> noise is uh, quiet is important for us. And the Wonder In project is very concerning. Just from my own personal experience, I know how easy it is for this quiet that we all enjoy to be disturbed. <laughs> Increased traffic will make the quiet go away. Off-road vehicles that are being advertised, as already mentioned, will make the quiet go away. Um, sounds and noises from people partying, maybe at the site, maybe not at the site, will make the quiet go away. Sound carries far in the desert, as we all know. Um, so all of these things are concerning. They're structural and they're also incidental, these noise increases that we will encounter because of this project. Some will be quote-unquote legal and some will be quote-unquote illegal noise increases. Do we really want all of that? Do we really think the noise will be less than significant? Which is the criteria apparently that is important. Do we truly believe that this noise increase will be less significant, having a less than significant impact on us? I don't think so. <laughs> um, so, in addition, this project by itself will open the door to other projects like it. Yeah. Will just increase everything that I already mentioned. What I would like you to, what I would like to ask you, is that if you have specific knowledge, personal experience, or expertise regarding noise <laughs> and how noise would be increasing because of this project, that you share that 
you share that information, you share that expertise, and you make it known to the county. That will help us to achieve exactly what Pat was referring to, not Pat, sorry, Chris was referring to earlier, which is getting back to an EIR. That's essentially all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Russ again. Some people call me Mike. Um, I'm here to talk about biological resources. Uh, on screen is this tortoise that was under our car. That's our vehicle or our cabin, which is about a half mile from the um, proposed development. Tortoises do exist out here. They do. Um, uh, what I'm going to do here on page 32. Well, first, here's the question that CEQA asks in biological resources. Would the project have substantial adverse effects, either directly or through habitat modifications, on any species identified as a candidate, sensitive or special status species in local or regional plans, policies, or regulations, or by the California Department of Fish and Wildlife or U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service? Here's what the developer stated on page 32 of the initial study. Sensitive wild. Okay, here's what they said. That is a tortoise. There are no documented desert tortoise occurrences on site or directly adjacent to the project site. Despite a systematic search of the project site, no live tortoises, suitable burrows, or signs were observed on the project site during the site investigation. Based on the results of the field investigation and lack of suitable burrows and no observed sign, <laughs> desert tortoise was determined to have a low potential to occur. Uh, okay. uh, next slide, please. They even confirm the statement. I'll read, I'll read this. Um, th th this is another thing that states they have low, uh, it's, it says pretty much the same thing, but they've come here to include um, scat. There is no desert tortoises or sign, i.e. scat, burrows, or carapaces. This is what the developers have stated on their biological resources. No tortoises, no nothing, no burrows, no scat, nothing. I'm going to stop right now and, and, and bring... Um, our winner of the Minerva Hoyt Award up here yeah. is Pat Whiting to continue the biological stuff. Thank you. Um, when I uh, heard that this project was going forward, I put in a phone call to Ed LaRue, who runs the Circle Mountain Biological uh, Association, and asked him if he had any tortoise studies out here. Ed LaRue uh, has been working for 33 years studying tortoise, and amazingly enough, when um, he does a project, he will have at the bottom, this is the first page of his project that I'll talk about in a second, it says, I certify that I have not signed a disclosure or non, a non-disclosure or consultant confidentiality agreement with the project applicant or applicant's representative and that I have no financial interest in the project. You can always ask Ed if he has done a study in the area. I knew from talking to people that there were tortoise out here, so I called up Ed and I said, do you have a study? Well, what he sent me was a study of the Wonder Insight. Oh, no. Yes. To propose, yes it is. And uh, guess what? He found tortoise. <laughs> and not only did he find tortoise, he took a picture of it. Oh, no. And then he uh, located the tortoise, the, the signs of the tortoise, whether it was a tortoise burrow or it was a tortoise, you know, in a uh, body of a young one or, you know, whatever. He found them. And um, he, I sent this study and this review of what you just heard from what was said in the um, initial study to the planners, and I also sent it to Ed LaRue. And he responded, saying, thank you, Pat. Um, I have had 33 years of experience, and in the period of time between when the developer had his studies done and when I did mine, which 
the, the, would not have disappeared what he found. So essentially, um, they didn't find anything because they didn't see it because they didn't know how to look for it. And it's possible they did it in the winter when they're underground, but still, they didn't know how to look for it, period. Um, what's even more interesting, and you keep this under your hat, okay? You got hats? Okay. You're being videotaped. Oh. Uh, this was this desert tortoise study for the site was prepared for Ecotech Design. And I called a contract person for Ecotech Design. This is April of last year, correct? Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, I asked him, you know, what about this? And he said for a very short period of time he had worked for the owner of the property, but then left their employee. And so Ecotech Design asked and LaRue to do it because he asked the top you know, researcher, and then he no longer worked for the developer. And it turns out nobody ever paid for this. So it's possible and probable that the owner of the property never saw it. However, that doesn't matter because now it has been seen and it has been filed with the county. So, yippee. <laughs> so that's what I have to say on that. So with our shortened time, there's a lot more we can get into each sequel matter, but um, this story tells you about that there are tortoises that exist on this site, and the owner has done this, this tells you something about the developers. It really does say something about what they actually care. Do they care to do a study? Do they care about the biological resources out here? The see no evil, hear no evil. And that's, right now, this is where we stand with biological resources. As we move forward, we'll do more research and send more information to the counties on it. Okay, uh, my name's Rick. I've been a resident uh, property owner out here for 23 years and live out here full time. Um, and I just want to follow on the biological and tortoise issue that relates some, to some degree to, to uh, transportation. You saw that beautiful picture of the tortoise under Russ and Tina's uh, vehicle. Just imagine, if you will, 200 car parking lot. People coming in and out, parking, and I don't think the parking lots are covered, but whatever. Tortoises, which are on the property, and we are documenting are all over the place. I'm creating a, a Google map of all my neighbors' pictures and sightings. Uh, they crawl under cars. The guests are partying. They're not thinking about the tortoise or making sure they're run, run over. So that's a transportation issue too. Yes. So I'm briefly gonna cover transportation and really it deals with how much traffic is gonna be generated by the 106 rooms, people coming, coming in and out, events, all that kind of stuff. Uh, the documentation in the initial study and the appendices are contradictory. The initial study says there's no real impact by the level of traffic that's going to come in, but there's one consultant study that says a further study is needed. Mm -hmm. So what's up with that? Uh, they make estimates about how much traffic is going to be generated by the 106 rooms, uh, people going in and out. And they go through this uh, convoluted thing about all of the uh, other uh, hotels in this area and people visiting the park and that it's only going to offset. There's not year over year an increase, which is ridiculous. There's three million people visiting the park. 
but that there's not going to be a change in net occupancy of all the rooms in 29 Palms okay. or whatever, but some that would, would be staying at the Motel 6 or the Inn or whatever will be coming to the Wonder Inn. So there's no net increase in traffic. But that really begs the issue of what the impact is going to be to us. They say, they estimate, that there will be another 604 per day trips to this place. Well, well maybe that's not a lot in the city, but that's a lot here. And, it, as we've been thinking about this and talking to people, the potential impacts of on-site events of non-residents mm -hmm. are going to increase traffic, which is nowhere projected in the initial study or the documentation. The documents submitted and diagrams uh, laying out what kind of road mod modifications are going to be made are inadequate. I've looked at other projects and their detailed uh, diagrams and engineering drawings of what they will need to do to modify this road. They kind of say they're going to do an exit lane and all that kind of stuff. Well, I want to see more. I want to know exactly what they're going to do and who's going to pay for it. And those of us who drive up and down, and my house is Gamma Mesa, northeast of that, uh, I'm going, whenever I go into town, or go anywhere, I'm going to that intersection of Amboy and Gamble. We know how dangerous that is. There's a rise in the road that is directly in front of the proposed end, the, the pink building. And I've had incidents where people are trying to pass me because I'm making a left-hand turn north onto Gamble to go home, and they're just too impatient. What's going to happen when people are bunching up, going each way? Another, and this is the last point I'll make, there's a lot more. In the study and the appendices, there is no mention of Gamble between Amboy and 62. The only mention of Gamble is a bordering uh, orientation on the east side of the property. What's going to happen when, naturally, people are coming from the park, they turn on their GPS, and they're going to get to the Wonder Inn. They're going to go down Gamble from 62. It's going to create dust, damage, increased road maintenance, yada, yada, yada. So they don't address that at all. Um, so that's another big concern. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff. Uh, that we're going to address that's going to be justification for an EIR relating to transportation. Thanks for listening. Thank standards or water discharge requirements? Would the project substantially deplete groundwater supplies or interfere with groundwater recharge? Um, as I mentioned before, the most recent studies um, are dated back to the 70s, um, so we do need more studies to be done on the recharge of the basin, how much water is being used here currently. Um, everybody knows that we've had the recent farming going on um, and a lot of water was used for that. Um, so we just, we need more information on it. The project is looking at using um, estimated, based on their um, studies, a seven, almost seven million gallons a year. Um, and we don't know how the drought has been affecting our basin, so more studies need to be done on that to protect our water, the people that live here. Um, the hydrology section also looks at water drainage patterns, runoff, and possible flood or mudslide effects that the project might have on the area and the surrounding um, property area. Thank you. Uh, 
covering the section of land use. Land use is pretty much what it says it is. It's the division of San Bernardino County's countywide plan that dictates the criteria for the use of land in a specified region. In the initial study, this CEQA question B is asked. Would this development cause a significant in environmental impact due to a conflict with any land use plan, policy, or regulation adopted for the purpose of avoiding mitigate, or mitigating an environmental effect? So here's what the Santa Barbara Countywide Plan, in the San, Bur uh, San Bernardino County uh, Countywide Plan, one of the four land use principle states, new development should be focused in areas where there is potable water, wastewater treatment, roadways, and public services. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the proposed project location has no potable water, no wastewater treatment, no, so no sewage system, unsubstantial roadways to handle increased traffic for this project, and there are no public services in Wonder Valley as I speak. So this, for some reason, they've gone forth with this in violating their own land use and plan planning description. So that same question above, uh, they answer again, will it cause a significant uh, or any conflict with any land use plan policy or regulation? Um, the second answer to this question, they state, the um, project site is located within an unincorporated area of county of the county and has a zoning designation of rural living and is not subject to a community plan. Uh -huh. This is what the developer stated. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we put the next slide up. Wonder Valley has a plan. Wonder Valley has a community action guide. Um, and we are subject to it. The Wonder Valley Community Action Guide already existed before the developers purchased the property. Yes. It has been available to them and they decided not to even attempt to look for it. Okay, so policy, this is all goes together. Land use, this is all coming from San Bernardino County. They dictate what's built and where. So this is policy LU, I'm gonna point to this one, LU 2.0. Three comply, all this pertains for purposes, here's what they state. We require that new development be, consi be consistent with and reinforce the physical and historical character and identity of our unincorporated communities as described in table LU3, which always lists more stuff, and in the value section of the community action guides. In addition, we consider the aspiration section of the community action guide in our review of new development. Um, go ahead and put the next one up, please. So this is page five of our uh, countywide plan, officially with the San Bernardino County. All of these, this is what they're required to follow. This is what's required per the county before you're supposed to build any new development. And look at what it includes. Rural atmosphere, the large lots and space between properties give residents room to breathe. We've seen this before because it applies to our community. We made this. Um, wide open spaces allow residents to appreciate and maintain the solitary, laid-back <coughs> lifestyle of this area. Natural desert beauty. Residents value the beautiful sunrises and sunsets, the dark and starry night skies, and the desert views and wildlife. The aspirations that it says that they shall follow. Uh, maintain the rural atmosphere. Wonder Valley provides residents with a rural lifestyle on large Lots with dark night skies. So, I mean, folks, it shouldn't have gotten this far. It shouldn't at all. Again, would the development, a question asked by it cause a significant environmental impact due to conflict with any land use plan, policy, or regulation adopted for the purpose of avoiding mitigating an environmental effect? Well, here's the answer they give to that question. Project would neither physically divide an established community nor cause a significant environmental impact due to conflict with any land use plans or policies. No significant impacts are identified or anticipated and no mitigation measures are required. This is what they say. My comment on this is how this community want to be represented is stated by the land use services element and the Wonder Valley Community Action Guide. 
the proposed project ignores or doesn't even reference any of the county guidelines that oversees this area. Um, and this proposed project is extremely conflicting with land use plans, policies, and requirements. Um, I think I can now, there's a couple other things I need to clarify with land use. They say it's a 24-acre site. They mentioned 25 acres, 28 acres. And then on page um, uh, 7 and 8, there's ex exhibitions 2 and 3 that outline the project is a larger 134.6 acres. If you don't understand, the owners, the developers purchased all the land around the pink building. And um, officially on the letter submitted to the county, this is only supposed to be a 24.4 acre site. But they're including this in their proposals. I don't know why. It's not part of anything official. They put these extra 134 acres in here on their ex exhibits, it's in the initial study. Are uh, they trying to slip this through? Are they trying to pull one over to us and say, no, we're not on 24.4 acres. Well, look, we put in 134 acres. We can do whatever we want on this land. We own it. Um, Sloppy. Mm, um, yeah, there's also another thing. They say, the developers state that they will be having weddings and events, recreational uses, and a conference center. Will any of these curricular activities occur outside the 24.84 acre site? If you go to their Facebook page, we've seen, they already have plans for everything they want to do on all the land they've already purchased with disregard for the community, the countywide plan, and the stuff they've submitted that what is this extra 134 acres? They don't submit that on their letter. This is not what they're um, stating they want to do, but they're slipping it in under our radar, and we need to um, be aware of that. And also, this extra, they don't state anything in regards to these extra weddings, events, how many extra traffic. It affects everything. It affects noise. It affects um, uh, emissions. It affects traffic. It affects the land. It affects land use. And they have, they state nothing about all, how many extra cars for these weddings and events, how many extra people, um, they say nothing about it. Are they having live bands, live music? What type of events do they plan to have? Nothing is mentioned, nothing. Before they know, they will have Burning Man. They don't care, once this thing is built, they're gonna be able, they're gonna do whatever they want. Once it's already built and passed, from then on, it's just a matter of, well, you know, we got this built. Why can't we do anything else? Are they intentionally leaving out this extra information? Um, one other thing is that yes, if this one development gets approved, it will be a precedent for the County of San Bernardino. Oh, you let these guys make it. Why can't any of you go on property elsewhere? They're not in eyesight. If you have any space nearby, someone else can come right back and say, oh, I want to build a a little party den next to you, or, or do this or that. It sets a precedence. Once they break ground and get approved to do it, anything is game, fair game, and wonder about it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Mark Houston. I'm a resident of Wonder Valley for almost 40 years now, so I've seen a few things come and go around here. Um, before I start into this, one, I'm going to make a comment on one of the earlier deliveries uh, concerning the uh, original purpose of the pink building site with the electric co-op. And one concern I would have as a scientist who studied soil contamination is they used heavy transformers that polychlorinated biphenyls, PCBs back then. That property had a storage yard. Were there any um, transformers or PCBs there? And if so, were any of those PCBs spilled in and burned down that land? That's right. They'll have a long life in the environment, and they'd still be there if, if, if they were. So, on with that. My, the concern I came up here for is one of the many uses of the pink building about 30 years ago um, was a site was used by a gold mining and exploration operation. Um, they were staging out of that site, doing laboratory research, um, and one, one of the uh, things they did is they conducted some activities there 
with gold recovery using active cyanide solution trickled through the gold ore and then trickled through activated charcoal columns to recover the gold. That's standard practice in the mining industry these days, cyanide recovery. But the big question is, what happened to the spent cyanide solution? Did they dispose of it responsibly? And how about any of the other metals or elements liberated from the gold, um, or liberated from the ore besides the gold? Did any, any of that reach the ground? You know, that's another thing that ought to be tested for, is heavy metals. And mercury. I don't know if they used mercury back then, and that's at that site, but it's, it was certainly a common practice in the industry back in the day to use mercury for fine gold recovery. So it raises that question. So the, the question is, are, so, are soil tests appropriate at that site? Yeah. I believe they are. I worked for several years at Joshua Tree National Park as a science tech. One of my assignments was sampling old mill sites in the park for the presence of cyanide. Based on results of that work, I can verify that it is possible for subsurface cyanide contamination to persist for decades. That's right. I propose that any site testing for the presence of heavy metals and cyanide be conducted prior to a Board of Supervisors vote on the Wonder End project. These results should be made public with opportunity for public input. That's right. yeah, yeah. Yeah. about cumulative effects of this project. This is, uh, we talked a lot about that in terms of the various uh, components of the CEQA analysis. How does the cumulative aspect... Cumulative effect, you know, and I'm just thinking, is cumulative NEPA or CEQA? I think it's maybe not CEQA, but there is the mandatory findings that are coming at the end, and that's where you can bring these things together. Can you, can you tell me if CEQA... Is uh, does it have a mandatory? Does it have a cumulative effect? Okay, I'm one of them doesn't, and I'm thinking it's CEQA that doesn't. But uh, that doesn't mean you can't mention it. You put it together. It's also the elements. For instance, when you talk about the dust, it's not only the traffic that's going out there. It's the ground that's being disturbed. That's the geology, and that goes underground in soils. So it's um, it's. Air quality, it's, then they don't bring those together, but you can. So, uh, I think we're doing Q&A now? Yeah, and, like and, we and a already. comment period. We, are, we have started it. And uh, this is Margaret and Chris. You've met uh, both of us. We're going to facilitate this particular uh, section. And just to say we know, and we could tell by some of the questions that have already been asked, that there is expertise in the room. There are things that people want to comment on. And what we want to encourage each and every one of you to do is to get those thoughts down in writing, let the planning commission know about it, let the county know about it. We're little grassroots groups of, of you know, of volunteers, some of us are doing this on top of, you know, what we ordinarily do. For example, my day start at 2.30 in the morning, that's when I get up for work. Uh, but still, you know, we're fighting the time to do this because we love this place. We love the desert. We love all the critters in it, not only the desert tortoise, but all of the critters in it. We love the creosote, we love the dark skies, and we're in it to win it. We're not here just to make a point. That's one of the reasons we went through this thing so carefully, okay? To let you all know what we have found, but to let you know that we're also not experts. So for this particular uh, section, Chris, prepared a marvelous document that's available at the end. Maybe we can even pass some out to everybody that has the information about what you can do, who you can write to, where you can, you, where you can contact, because we're a self-help operation. We're a self-help community here in Wonder Valley. Those of us in Stop Wonder Inn, we don't work for you. We work with you. We are part of the community. So all of us have to do this together. So if you've got a great idea of something to do, we need your help to do it. You know, you mention a great idea and think somebody else is going to do it. No. 
If we as a community don't do it, let me tell you, it ain't gonna happen. It's not gonna get done. So we do wanna hear from you now. Um, you may have questions, you have comments, you have suggestions, please write stuff down. We are running a little, a little behind, but please know that this is an interactive thing. We took the time, we hope you appreciate it. We did a lot, you know, studied as best we could to present what we know, but that's not the end of it. More research is needed, more help is needed. Is that right? Did I forget anything here? Uh, I don't think so. Yeah, so if you have a question, you could, um, if you don't want to get on camera, you could be over on this side. You could stand if you've got a loud voice. Is that okay for the videographer? Do you need people yeah. coming closer mm -hmm. and using the mic? I need them closer. Could you come on up and use the mic? You could form a line right and here if you have a question or a comment. Richard, come on. And I, have I need 30 seconds to switch out. around. He needs 30 seconds to just move, move the camera. Presentation is going to be on uh, yes. the website. Yes. Okay, good. That'll be very helpful. And can we choose the specific topics and talk to that person that was on to dig deep, a deeper dive with that and work with that person that was there? Okay. We right. would love that. Right. We really need um, any kind of expertise or experience that people have. It needs to, uh, it obviously needs to get to land use services and comments, but it also would good, be good to be able to share that. If you have that kind of information, get in touch with us at info at stopwonderin.org. It's on, it's on your handout. Uh, or you can leave your name and contact with Gina at the table back there. Um, we, we're trying to network. That's what's going to help us win this, isn't it? So, all right. Any other comments or questions, concerns? Hi, my name is Alicia Pike. I'm the co-host of a desert protection podcast called Nine Miles from Needles. Yeah, we, it, we, we gotta get What's people in. It's I'm, called Ninety Miles from Needles, oh, okay. which Wonder Valley is in that range. Um, so I'd like to do a segment on this project, and I see that we have a really small window for me to produce it. So if anyone in this room would be interested in being interviewed, you have something you want to say. You want to set up something with me? Please see me anytime today. I'm going to leave a few cards on the front table so you can get in touch with me if you want. Okay? Uh, I just like to comment that uh, you know this place used to be sign dust control zone. Upon entering it, from either side, this is a dry lake bed down here. So. I mean, if uh, there needs to be a particulate study done by this group, so that uh, what if their guests are inhaling PM 2.5 particulate caused by this project? You know, you're inviting people into a potentially dangerous uh, breathing situation. So uh, anyway, I just wanted to make that comment, particularly about it, because it's something you cannot mitigate. You can't hose the whole area down 24-7. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, real quick, my name is Demir Chikoche. I live down the street. Anyway, uh, coyotes. I've seen three coyotes get hit. People driving so fast down this road. Um, and that's, you know, I think the other day one got hit. I heard it. I, had, I, was, I couldn't find it. I heard the sound. And I drove down the street, but I couldn't find it, so I know it's probably either dead somewhere. It probably drives itself off the street. But yeah, people drive too fast, so if, if they probably goes through, it's going to be even more coyotes because it, it is, you know, in my in my property, the coyotes come and visit, walk around right walk right through. Yeah. So and, and I see them going across the street and everything. So it's, I saw three coyotes get hit, get killed or anything. So that's not good. If, so I, can, that's not if I could amplify that. Uh, on this property, Mike, on this property, uh, proposed property, uh, in their materials, they say that people can bring their pets. Oh, oh. <laughs> 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 We've been speaking about the, uh, the coyotes. coyotes. Poor Fluffy. <laughs> 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 
Right. Yes. <laughs> you know what I, I wanted to say also is please, that please. your personal experience, like what was just described, mm -hmm. is really, really important to just write it up, even just a, a few things. Send it into planning commission, send it into the board of supervisors. If you're thinking, well, it's just a small point because it's just some coyotes getting run over. It's not a small point. So we're really encouraging you. Don't feel you have to be an expert in something. We live here. What experiences have you had that you know will be impacted by this project? So please get that information in. Be sure to get the sheet that Chris kindly prepared so you'll know where to send stuff. Okay. On, just on that same subject, uh, we all know that people let their dogs run loose out here as well. And I personally just had to swerve last night to avoid a German Shepherd running across the Amboy in front of me when I left the Palms last wow. night. So, you know, there's also people's uh, domestic pets around here that are running free and could easily be affected by that as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're going to cause traffic accidents. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. This fellow over here. No, oh, thank you. My name is Steve, and I'm with the 29 Palms Astronomy Club, and I know we had some mention. Thank you. We do stargazing events and public outreach, educational events all around. Uh, of course, Wonder Valley is amazing for its night skies, and we did hear a little bit about the light pollution. But And although that might be a relatively superficial thing, there are some far more serious things on the table from this proposal. But I'm here as an expert on astronomy, on light pollution, because for me personally, that is a very important issue. So the 29 Palms Astronomy Club really want to be at the forefront of supporting action on this project. So, now I'm actually a resident of Wonder Valley as well. I live on Gamble Road between Amboy and 62. So what you were talking about, and the dust that flies on that road, and those who live on that area of Gamble Road, we know each other's cars very well. <laughs> and it sure kicks up a lot of dust all the time. We always go nice and slow, and we can tell when someone is just passing through when they're traveling 40 or 50 miles an hour, and a big plume of dust is flying out. And that just comes right down to us. We're on the, we're on the east side of Gamble, so all that dust just flows through and lands there. So that's also a very big concern about that. I don't have a well on my property, so I can't speak to that, but that is one of my biggest concerns is the aquifer and how much water they're going to be drawing out. So I mean, those are some very serious things, but in terms of night sky and astronomy, it will absolutely have an impact. And maybe a similar type of project would be the auto camp in Joshua Tree. Yep. Are we familiar with, yep. with this? So that's in the middle of Joshua Tree, not very dark to begin with, but I imagine they tried to make similar concessions and similar efforts to mitigate the amount of lights, and they didn't do too much. As, as nice as those lights are, as shield as they are, they don't do much in the end. And I'm afraid that's going to happen here. The night skies will be very drastically affected by the Wonder Inn. So we have to, in terms of astronomy and enjoying the night sky, because we all love night skies Yay! up here. I mean, it's one of the last refuges for enjoying the darkness. And it's, very, it's a very important thing to help preserve so other future generations can enjoy them to come. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Okay, my question is, um, the casino up there has uh, absolutely shielded their lights, but I can see them where I live in Desert Heights, and so it's the height of the pole. The height of the pole is a very important thing, and there, I, I, I read briefly through the report specifically looking for lighting issues and they said they were compliant with yada 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 but, that but they it did. gave very very few details and left me asking more questions about what would be happening there so and i so i was thinking and i just want to ask if you know this is good thinking is that 
okay, your lights would work if they're shielded at no more than 3,000 lumens, but they can't be more than five feet high. Yeah. Uh, you know, because then you won't see underneath them. You know, you'll be seeing at them. You know, does that, you know, I mean, that's a joke, really. I mean, what would five feet high lights do for you when you went to the pub? Probably nothing. But I, does that make sense? It does. It absolutely does. No matter how dim the light is, no matter how well it's shielded, it's still going to create ambient light flow. Mm -hmm. And that's the end result of any artificial light. I mean, it's, it's the, the whole point of, the, of, of Ida and trying to get things to change is more for large, large cities and trying to mitigate that light flow. To Ida. To Ida, so yes. Ida, yes. We'll tell them what that is. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, the casino, they did a the lot of The International efforts. Dark Sky. The International so. Dark Sky Association, and... Yeah. I mean, As in right here, my There we go! Yeah. 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 Now, let's, uh, before we forget, what date is the Dark Skies? We're going to be having yeah. a Dark Skies We're really glad that program you're, you're going to be working um, with here. us. And right. also, right. quite separate from Stop Wonder in the project, the, we're working with Friends of Wonder Valley um, to have an event right here at the center. The, the probable date that we're trying to work on right now is the 25th of um, February. Uh -huh. But we'll be getting that information out. Steve Bardwell, who is here, I think, Steve, where are you? Steve yeah. is still right. here. Yeah. And so we want to work with you because it would be wonderful for Wonder Valley to be a model dark skies community, yeah. Yeah. but also given the income level of people in the community for us to work to see if we could find resources to help people yeah. if they need you know, help in terms of mitigating and, and making sure we protect the dark sky. So it's wonderful that you're here. Please be sure to Absolutely. leave your contact information and put yes. the name of your organization next to it so we'll know uh, how to be in touch, but we will be getting the, the final information out about this event. Friends of Wonder Valley um, will um, help us get the publicity out, and we're hoping that our group, um, uh, Stop um, Wonder In, can also post um, the information on our website, although it won't be a Stop Wonder In. Um, event. It will be Friends of Wonder Valley and it will be co-sponsored by um, the Morongo the Morongo Basin Conservation Association. group as well. Steve and Sarah and so thank you. Again. Thank you Steve Bardwell will yeah. be our, our featured uh, speaker there. I think this gentleman had a question. You had a question? Um, yes. The, uh, the can we Can we need a mic? Where's there a microphone? I don't know. Can you hear me? Yeah, let's, yeah. let's help out our videographer. Yeah. He's working really hard here. Uh, Let's try to work with it. Yeah, Sorry. hi. <laughs> yeah, I was uh, uh, the, the list of uh, of elements um, that would need to be considered in a formal um, EIR if you're able to get back to square one on this thing. I noticed there were two related elements, uh, but they're distinct. One was cultural resources, and then the other uh, were uh, tribal uh, cultural resources. Do I understand that right? Those. So and from, a, and from a policy and analytical perspective, they would be tr tr treated um, separately. They would have their own uh, elements within the, within the plan. And it seems to me that the community action guide, which kind of got ignored in, these, in the uh, rough draft, I would call it, that was you know, submitted to the, uh, you know, to the county, that document would really plug into the cultural resources element that's where it lives and i don't mean to denigrate you know that you know the tribe the tribe they actually try to address that they talk about you know the history of uh of the of, uh, of, of, of tribal relics and archaeology you know out there it was a pretty pro forma study 